So chapter 10, section four. Today we're gonna learn about inscribed angles and polygons. So the first thing we're gonna do is define what an inscribed angle and what an intercepted arc is. So an inscribed angle is an angle whose vertex is on a circle and whose sides contain chords of the circle. Now before, we only talked about central angles and that's when the vertex was at the center of the circle. Now, when we describe an inscribed angle, the vertex is sitting here on the side of the circle. These sides of this angle are going to be chords. When it was a central angle, we had a circle here, and then the sides were formed by radii, or ra they were radiuses. So this would be an example of a central angle where the center is the vertex. So that's the difference between a central angle and an inscribed angle. The inscribed angle, the vertex is on the side, and then the intercepted arc, that definition is an arc that lies between two lines, rays, or segments. So in this picture, the intercepted arc here formed by that inscribed angle is right here. Same thing on the central angle, this would be the intercepted arc for that central angle. So the next slide has the theorem. So this slide has the measurement of the inscribed angle. And when you wanna find the measure of an inscribed angle, the measure of, it's gonna be half of the measure of its intercepted arc. So if I give you the measure of the angle to find the arc measure, all you do is times it by two and it's 60. If I give you the arc measure, you divide it by two or times it by a half to get the angle measure. Remember, central angles and their intercepted arcs are equal. So the central angle equals the arc measure, but the intercepted arc is going to be, ha um, the angle will be half of the arc measure. The next one is another theorem and it's called the inscribed angles of a circle theorem. And this one states that if two inscribed angles of a circle intercept the same arc, then the angles are congruent. So let me trace over the two angles that are pictured here. I actually have angle one, it's formed by this chord and this chord, so here is angle one. Notice its intercepted arc is arc AB. So then if I trace over angle two, notice angle two's intercepted arc is also AB. So when the two angles share the same arc, then those two angles, angle one, is gonna be congruent to angle two. And if I wanted to find the measure, let's say I told you this arc measure was 40, then I knew that both of the angles are gonna be half of that. <coughs> so angle one will be 20, and angle two will also be 20 because they're both half of its arc measure. This one is called the inscribed polygon and circumscribed circle. So an inscribed polygon is just a polygon with all of its vertices on a circle. Think of the word inscribed as being inside. So the polygon is inside the circle. When I talk about a circumscribed circle, this is a circle that contains the vertices of an inscribed polygon. Now, the pictures that are below here, they're describing um, both, whether it's inscribed or circumscribed. It's just the way that you state the sentence. So I could say that the triangle is inscribed in the circle, or I could also say the circle is circumscribed about the triangle also say the circle is circumscribed 
about the quadrilateral, either way. The next one is called the inscribed right triangle theorem. And this one states that if a right triangle is inscribed in a circle, then the hypotenuse is the diameter of the circle. Conversely, if one side of an inscribed triangle is a diameter <laughs> of the circle, then the triangle is a right triangle and the angle opposite the diameter is the right angle. So if you notice the words if and only if here, this means it could go either way. So they could either give you that this angle ABC here is a right angle, then you could state that AC is the diameter. Or if they tell you AC is the diameter, then you know that that's a right triangle and angle ABC is 90 degrees. If you recognize that this angle B here or ABC, <coughs> this is an inscribed angle. It's got its vertex on the side of the circle. If you notice its intercepted arc, its endpoints are the endpoints of the diameter. This is a semicircle arc and it measures 180 degrees. And we just learned that the measure of an intercepted angle, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, inscribed angle is half of its intercepted arc. So this arc is 180 divided by two and this angle is 90 degrees. The next theorem is called the inscribed quadrilateral theorem. And this one states that a quadrilateral can be inscribed in a circle if and only if its opposite angles are supplementary. Now, it's not talking about a specific quadrilateral. It's just a four-sided shape. And the opposite angles are going to be supplementary. So if you were to add angle 1 plus angle 3, they would equal 180. If you added 2 plus 4, it would also be 180 because these are opposite angles. If you thought about a parallelogram, the specific parallelogram it would need to be in order to satisfy this would be a rectangle or a square. Parallelogram, opposite angles are congruent. So in order for the angles to be congruent and be supplements, they would both need to be 90. So that's why it would need to be a square or a rectangle. It could also be a rhombus as well. All right, next slide has use, a useful fact. It's just piggybacking off of our inscribed right triangle theorem. So useful fact number one, an, ins an angle inscribed in a semicircle is a right angle. So in this picture, angle one is a right angle because it is inscribed in this semicircle. And again, its intercepted arc is 180. It's a semicircle arc. And if you think about the angle that's forming that intercepted arc, here it's gonna be half of that 180, and that's why angle one is a right angle, and it's 90 degrees. Now we're gonna do examples. So for the first one, let me zoom on in here. Now, when you're doing the homework tonight, you need to tell me, like at the beginning, just like last night, justify or give me the reason, the theorem that justifies why you're answering the question. So for this first one, let me go ahead and trace over some of these chords that are forming the angles. So if I trace over this chord, which is forming the 20 degree angle, so this angle right here is 20 degrees, and then I know that it's intercepted arc measure, the X, is gonna be two times that angle. So to find X, I'm doing two times 20, and X equals 40 degrees. Now, to find Y, what I can use is the measure of an inscribed angle theorem, and angle Y here, let me go ahead and trace over this, Angle Y is this whole thing. 
So I already found this little blue intercepted arc, and I already know that this one is 110. So to find angle Y, I'm going to first find the measure of its intercepted arc here by adding 110 and 40, and I get 150. And then I have to divide that by 2 because it's going to be half of its measure. So this angle Y is 75 degrees. And the way that I know how to do this calculation is by using the measure of an inscribed angle theorem. For part B, so the theorem I used here was the measure of an inscribed angle theorem. And that just states that the arc measure is double the angle, or if they give you the arc measure divided by two to get the angle. Now for part B, again, I'm gonna trace over some of these chords so I can figure out what's happening where. So I already see I have a 20 degree angle here, which is right here. So I know that its intercepted arc is gonna be double that. So the intercepted arc is 40 degrees. And if you notice, the reason why I did that first was to help me find the measure of angle X. So if I trace over these lines, that these chords that are creating angle X, I can see that it has the same intercepted arc. So X is going to be congruent to that other red angle. So X is also equal to 20. The next thing I can find is the measure of angle Y. Angle Y is up here. If you notice that this line right here is the diameter. So this right triangle is inscribed in this semicircle. So one way you can think of it is, as this intercepted arc here is 180, then I can just divide it by two, and then that's gonna be a 90 degree angle, or you could use your inscribed right triangle theorem either way. So Y equals 90 degrees. So you can either use the same theorem that we used over here. And then for Y, you could use the inscribed right triangle theorem. Example C for this one. <clears throat> I'm going to trace over the 60 degree angle. I can see that its intercepted arc is right here. So if the angle is 60, the arc measure is going to be double that. So 2 times 60 and angle X is 120. In order to find Y, I can go about finding Y several different ways. If you recognize that the circle has a full 360 degrees, you can add the two arcs that we already have. We already have this one and the 120. So we can add 140 and 120 and get 260. And now to find this last missing piece of Y, subtract that from 360. And that missing arc, which is Y, is going to be 100 degrees. The other way that you could have done it is you could have also traced over the angle that is forming the 140 arc, and then that would be half, that would be 70, and then you could use your triangle sum, add 60 and 70, get 130, subtract from 180, which would now make this angle 50, and then its intercepted arc would be two times that, and you can get 100 that way as well. So on that one, we were using our triangle sum. Um, mostly what we were using was the measure of an inscribed angle theorem.
All right, and then for D, what I can use here is I could use my inscribed right triangle theorem. I could also, let's see what else I could do. Let me go ahead and trace over some stuff. Let me trace over the angle that is formed by this 80 degree arc. And that's gonna be angle X. So I could use my measure of my inscribed angle again, take 80 divided by two, and X equals 40 degrees. Now, if you also recognize that this is a diameter, then this is going to be a semicircle arc. So if part of it's 80, this other part that's right here is going to be 180 minus 80, and that piece will be 100. Now, in order to find angle Y, I could use my congruent corresponding chords theorem. Because I have two congruent chords right here, then I know that their corresponding arcs right here are also congruent. So this piece is 100. So then the angle that's forming that 100 degree arc is gonna be half of the 100, which is gonna be the measure of Y. So it'll be 50. So they're asking us to write a proof. They're giving us that circle O is congruent to circle P, and they're also telling us that arc AC is congruent to arc AB. They want us to prove these two triangles inside these circles are congruent. We're reaching back to our five shortcuts. Side, 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 angle, side, hypotenuse leg, angle, side, angle, or angle, angle, side. So let me go ahead and set up my columns. So I have my statements and my reasons. So my first statement is that given, and I'm gonna abbreviate here. I'm gonna do the symbol for circle. So I'm doing circle O, congruent to circle P, and arc AC is congruent to arc AB. And this is given. Okay, the next thing I want to do is use that given. And because I have congruent corresponding arcs here, then their corresponding chords are also gonna be congruent. So I could also now state that AC is congruent, and I'm talking about chords now, not arcs. Chord AC is congruent to AB, and this reason is the congruent corresponding chords theorem. Pretty good. All right, so for number three, okay, so for number three, we're going to use the fact that angle CEA is equal to half of its intercepted arc measure. Same with angle BDA, it's also half of its intercepted arc, which is AB. And this is the theorem called the measure of an inscribed angle theorem. Now remember, when we're trying to prove two triangles are congruent, I'm looking for three pieces of information. Right now I only have one, the congruent chords. Now what I'm gonna be using is this information and I'm gonna be doing some substitution. So what I'm gonna do now is because I was told that arc AC and arc, I mean, arc AC and AB are congruent here, what I'm gonna do is substitute. So since these are congruent arcs, I'm gonna substitute AB in here for AC because up here they're congruent. 
So my next statement is substitution, and I'm gonna say that angle CEA is equal to one half of arc AB. And that reason is substitution. Now I'm gonna do one more substitution. And since arc, half of arc AB equals BDA, I can now substitute BDA for the one half AB. So I'm gonna go ahead and now angle CEA is now congruent to angle BDA. And this is again a substitution. So now I have a side marked as congruent and now I also have BDA congruent to CEA. I just need to find one more piece of congruency and what I can do now is because these are inscribed triangles and they're actually inscribed in a semicircle, that tells me that angle B and angle C both equal 90 degrees. They're right angles. So angle B and angle C both equal 90. And I'm using the inscribed right triangle theorem. And now I can do a substitution. I'm gonna say that angle B is congruent to angle C, and that's either substitution or transitive. And now I could add the congruency mark in the picture. So B and C are congruent. And now I have enough information and I can prove that the triangles are congruent by angle, angle, side. So now the last step is triangle ABD is congruent to triangle ACE, and that reason is angle, angle, side. And that is it for the proof and the end of 10-4's notes.